Good morning, everyone. My name is Flora Wang. I'm the manager for Nutrition and Scientific Affairs at the Canadian Sugar Institute Nutrition Information Service. It is my pleasure today to be the moderator, and I would like to welcome you all to the webinar. We're grateful to have two experts in the field, Professor Douglas Goff and Professor Julian Cooper, to talk about the functional roles of sugar that go beyond sweetness, as well as the challenges in replacing or reducing sugars in foods. So any time during the webinar, you may submit your questions to either speakers or both um, in the questions um, box at the right side of your screen, and we have about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. So we also will encourage you to share your learnings today on Twitter using hashtag NotJustSweetness. And the webinar will be archived for your access at a later time as well. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker today, Dr. Douglas Goff. Dr. Goff has been a professor in the Department of Food Science at the University of Guelph for almost 30 years. He teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in introductory food and nutritional sciences, food carbohydrates, dairy technology, and functional foods and nutraceuticals. He has written over 200 publications, and his research interests include the functional contribution of sugars and other carbohydrates in food systems. He's also the co-author of the textbook called Ice Cream. So now please join me in welcoming Dr. Goff. Okay, good afternoon everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, and uh, to provide this overview of the functional roles of sugar in foods and then uh, associated with that the challenges in, in trying to replace sugar in foods uh, to produce uh, uh, lower sugar alternatives. Um, so that is the topic that I will address. Um, before we get on to the content of my topic, uh, we wanted to throw this question in to everybody, and then we'll look at the results uh, a little bit later on. And so the question is, the only reason that sugar is added to ice cream is for the sweet flavor. And we'd like you to take a couple of minutes and respond to that. Uh, question, and then uh, later in my talk, we'll come back and revisit that question. So I'll just pause for a few seconds while everybody submits their answer. Okay, I, I wanted to begin with just to make, make sure that everybody understands the term sugar. Uh, it can often be confusing, and we do use it in more than one context. So just a very uh, quick overview of carbohydrate chemistry. Uh, carbohydrates are this complex group of uh, food components, um, and when we talk about the carbohydrates in general, we refer to both the sugars, which are the monosaccharides and disaccharides, and then the polysaccharides, the, the complex carbohydrates, starch and all of the um, dietary fibers and so on that we consume. So we've got the sugars and the polysaccharides that are part of carbohydrates. Within the sugars category, the monosaccharides, uh, the main food monosaccharides would be glucose, galactose, and fructose. Uh, and some of those are found naturally in their individual form in foods. Or those three can be put together into various configurations to make the common disaccharides of which we have sucrose, uh, a combination of glucose and fructose, and then maltose, which would be the disaccharide of two glucose units, and lactose, the disaccharide of glucose and galactose uh, linked together. So we collectively call all of these the sugars, and people can refer to, for example, their blood sugar level when they're referring to glucose, and we can talk about milk sugar when we're talking about lactose, but also, in common parlance, we use the term sugar to mean sucrose. And I think if you ask most everybody out on the street what they mean by the term sugar, they'd talk about the white uh, material that they put in their coffee and so on. And so that's generally sucrose or table sugar. So just to make sure we all know what we're referring to here. In the remainder of what I have to say, I will be referring uh, specifically to sucrose functionality, but certainly 
sugar functionality uh, oftentimes goes, goes beyond that to refer to some of these other disaccharides as well. Okay, so I have divided my talk into really two areas that I'll cover in about uh, uh, 10 minutes each. And the first is the, an overview of the functional properties of sugar in food. And then the second will be a, a little bit of a quick case study in terms of uh, ice cream. So if we look first of all at this slide, it's the overview of all of the functional properties that I will speak of. And we can divide those into sensory properties like sweetness, flavor perception, uh, texture and appearance. We have very important food preservation properties uh, or microbial properties. Uh, and microbial uh, properties also refer to the role of sugar in fermentation, and I'll speak about that briefly. Um, we have a number of, of chemical contributions that sugar makes in reactions like caramelization and Maillard browning and plasticization of polymers, and I'll explain what I mean by those in, with a couple of slides. And then phase transitions, both the phase transition of the sugar itself in crystallization uh, and also the control or the impact of sugar on phase transitions of, of water, in other words, uh, freezing and freezing point depression. So that's just an overview, and we'll take each one of those up in, in at least some bit of detail. So first of all, the sensory properties, and certainly uh, sugar sweetness is the first thing that, that we all talk about in terms of a functional property. Sugar provides... Uh, a very clean, uh, sweet profile with very uh, good time intensity profiles. Um, so it, it doesn't give us a, a very rapid burst of sweetness. Uh, and it, it lingers for a while, but it doesn't linger too long neither. So it's really sort of the gold standard in terms of sweetness. If you were to compare that to fructose, for example, you get a much higher peak, but a shorter level of intensity. So oftentimes when we're just looking at sweeteners, we compare this time intensity profile to, to, to try to match um, sweetness. But beyond sweetness, certainly we have a lot of sugar added to food to um, enhance flavors and flavor perception. Uh, if I could give you just a couple of examples of that, we add sugar to chocolate, for example, to offset some of the bitterness that's there. Um, we add sugar to yogurt um, to uh, offset some of the sourness or the acid component of the yogurt. Uh, and likewise, we add sugar to tomato ketchup uh, to balance the acidity of the tomatoes. And uh, sugar is often used in things like granola bars and so on um, to, to um, offset the, perhaps the bitterness or the flavor profile that you might get from some of the underlying brand material or whatever else might be present in the, in the granola bar. So there's a number of examples there where it's not just sweetness that we're looking at, but the effect of uh, the sugar on uh, flavor perception and enhancement. Also, sweetness enhances aroma so that it, it helps to bring out some of the flavor profiles. And, and there's many examples where a little bit of sugar will help bring out the underlying base aroma and flavor that's present within a food system. Uh, and uh, sensory properties also include texture. Sugar contributes viscosity. Uh, and that viscosity is very important in giving us the sort of mouthfeel that we want. If you think about uh, juice beverages, for example, uh, the cranberry juice that I showed, or even uh, soft drinks, if you compare a sugar-sweetened soft drink to a uh, high-intensity sweetener soft drink, you get a different uh, a texture, a different mouthfeel because of the syrupy kind of a contribution that sugar makes to viscosity. Um, uh, Jello would be another example where the sugar gives you certainly the, the textural properties of, of the jello because of its interaction with the gelatin gel, but also because of the viscosity of the water phase that's trapped within that gelatin gel. So under sensory, we can include both sweetness, but also impacts on flavor and texture. Uh, one of the very, very important roles of sugar in food is uh, controlling what we call the water activity. This is a measure of the availability of water for microbial growth, um, and it, it's a much better measure than the water content of a food material. 
So lowering the water activity will give you um, stability and shelf life issues. If a food has a high water activity, typically it has to be refrigerated or uh, processed in some way that will give you that shelf life. But if the water activity is low enough that there's not sufficient water available to support microbial growth, then the product becomes shelf stable at room temperature. And we've got many, many examples where sugar has been used in food to give you that preservation property. And strawberry jam would be a, an ideal example. The sugar content uh, lowers the water activity sufficiently that the strawberry jam has a long shelf life at, at ambient temperature as opposed to a, a fresh uh, sliced strawberry uh, puree or mixture. Fruitcakes would be another example. Certainly um, um, a high level of water content to give you the softness uh, and the texture of, of a cake, and yet um, no microbial growth concerns because of the lower water activity. Uh, sweetened condensed milk would be another example where uh, the sugar is added to the sweetened condensed milk as a preservative. Um, it, it ends up with a sweet product, and so that's used in, in various applications, but the sugar really gives you the preservation property. Also under microbial influences, we can talk about fermentation. Uh, we have many, many, many uh, fermented foods that we consume from pickles and sauerkraut to cheeses and, and wines and beers and, and uh, of course, bakery products, and, uh, which are, are yeast uh, fermented. But in all of these cases, the bacteria or the yeasts or molds that are growing require a, a, a sugar source uh, to ferment and uh, the sugar ends up being fermented to things like um, acids or to carbon dioxide to produce gases and so on. So that, that, that growth substrate in, in um, many of our fermented foods comes from sugar. Uh, so examples here would be uh, yeast leavened baked products um, like our yeast leavened donuts or bread products where the sugar that's in the dough uh, is responsible for boosting the fermentation level to a reasonable rate, and that often produces the carbon dioxide that gives you the leavening action and the lightness in texture of the uh, fermented product. Um, yogurt would be another great example where the bacteria are fermenting the lactose in that case. That's not a sugar, uh, not a sucrose example, but nevertheless just an important example to illustrate the effect of sugars on uh, microbial fermentations. Uh, and then moving on to some of the chemical examples, uh, we know that sugar, uh, when heated, will caramelize, and that contributes flavor and color. Uh, we can think of simple examples like making a caramel, uh, where you just take a sugar solution uh, and heat that uh, under the right conditions to produce a, the, the typical flavor and color that you expect from caramel. Uh, other examples would be peanut brittle uh, in the manufacture of toffees, the dark color of molasses, the dark color of brown sugar. Um, all of those would be examples of um, uh, caramelization. And uh, those are, are very obvious examples, but uh, again, in many foods that you do get slight caramelized undertones uh, just from heating of a product with that, that has sugar in it. It may not come out as a caramel flavor or a dark color per se, but you get some of that underlying note. And um, uh, ice cream mix would be a good example of that, and I'll, I'll talk about ice cream uh, in a, a few minutes. But oftentimes we get a very slight caramelized note just from the pasteurization of the ice cream mix. Uh, Maillard browning is another very uh, important browning reaction, non-enzymatic browning reaction in food systems. Um, and this comes about from the reaction of reducing sugars uh, with amino acids. Very complicated reaction, but it leads to a series of both flavors and dark pigments that uh, are responsible for um, things like uh, ro the color of roasted meats and roasted nuts and roasted coffee beans and so on and so on. Uh, the crust, the bread would be a good example 
where the Maillard reaction is giving you the browning on the crust. And if you toast a piece of bread, uh, the, the, the dark color that results on the surface of the toast would be a good example of, of Maillard reaction. Now, sucrose isn't a reducing sugar per se, um, but in many of these examples that I just gave you, there is some hydrolysis of the sucrose to yield some glucose, and that glucose then becomes the reducing sugar to react. Uh, in Maillard browning. Another good example of a chemical reaction is in the plasticization. And what do I mean by that term? Well, the sugar in, many, in several examples interacts with a polymeric network to modify the properties of the polymeric network. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. One would be a starch gel. Um, if you just make a something like a uh, pudding, as I show in the slide here, or just a simple starch uh, solution, um, it will oftentimes give you a very brittle gel that will uh, crack and not have nice soft mouthfeel texture to it. But often the sugar will, it, what it actually does is sort of pull some of the moisture out of the, of the starch. Uh, and by doing that, it, it softens up the gel texture and gives you a, a better mouthfeel. So that's what we refer to as this term plasticization. It softens up the polymeric network. And starch would be example. Uh, the effect of starch on gluten formation in doughs would be another good example where the presence of sugar will influence the strength and integrity of the gluten, make it again softer with, with a, a more enhanced and more improved sort of texture. Phase transitions, we've got an entire confectionery industry that's based on controlled crystallization of sugar. Uh, so I, I provide some examples there of, uh, of a fondant, for example, or fudge. In these cases, we start with a very warm, uh, supersaturated sugar solution, and we have to very carefully control the way the sugar crystallizes. If you've ever made fudge before, you know the importance of um, uh, beating that and stirring it and so on. That controlled stirring is what gives us the very small crystals that we need for that really smooth texture. And if you allow the sugars to crystallize into too big of a crystal, then you um, get a coarse, grainy kind of a texture in the fudge, and the same with a, a, a fondant. So controlling that crystallization gives rise to, to the texture that you get in, in many of these confectionery products. The sugar glasses would be the hard candies, like the lifesavers and the clear sugar candies that I show in that bottom slide there on the uh, right corner. Uh, in those cases, you're starting with, uh, again, your, your supersaturated sugar solution, but you cool it down so quickly that it forms this, this amorphous solid material that we refer to as a glass. Uh, and we can trap flavors in that and so on to make all these different candies that we have. But again, it's, it's the, the, the ability of the sugar to go into this glassy state that gives rise to, to all of those, those, those candy type products. And then the addition of sugar depresses the freezing point of water. Uh, in, in, as do all solutes like salt. I often talk about adding salt to the highways to melt ice, not, not today in Toronto or Guelph, but uh, uh, we could equally as well add sugar to the, to the ice on the highways to melt the ice, but it wouldn't be very uh, cost effective um, uh, or environmentally sustainable. Um, However, it does uh, just illustrate the importance of sugar on freezing point depression. And so again, another example would be the freezing of fruits versus the freezing of vegetables, where in the freezing of fruit, it remains somewhat soft because of the depression of the freezing point of the water in the fruit material. So uh, a great example of that will be ice cream, and the softness and scoopability of ice cream comes from the sugar the role of the sugar in the ice cream itself. And so I will spend the next five minutes just talking about the role of sugar in ice cream. Before I do that, let's just look at our uh, poll results. And uh, the question was, the only reason that sugar is added to ice cream is for the sweet flavor. 
and we have 85% uh, disagreeing with that, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to see that. It, it illustrates that most of you realize that sugar does play very important functional roles in products. Um, so let's look at what we actually meant by that question. So example of sugar reduction challenge, I would say that ice cream frozen desserts is a great example of that. There is certainly a driving force for the uh, no sugar added types of frozen desserts. They do play an important role in the market and we all are aware of the uh, global diabetes trends and those suggest that there is a consumer demand for low glycemic index type products. Uh, what I'm comparing here is the uh, ingredient list for um, two ice cream products, a no sugar added uh, product from our uh, local uh, Canadian market here, and the original vanilla ice cream from that same manufacturer. Some of you may recognize those labels. Uh, it's not the manufacturer that matters, it's, it's what they did with their product. Um, so in the no sugar added example, here it's sweetened with maltitol and sucralose. And this gives me the chance to speak to exactly what the maltitol is doing in that particular case. And in that case, the maltitol and sucralose combination has replaced the sugar uh, and glucose that you see in the um, lower example, the regular ice cream example. I did also want to point out on the nutrition facts table from both of those products that the caloric content is exactly the same. So in this case, the sugar reduction uh, gave you lower glycemic index, but the purpose of the sugar reduction was not caloric reduction. Okay, so uh, we this is a very quick overview of ice cream mix composition. You can see that typically we use uh, sucrose at 10 up to maybe 15% in a, in a normal base mix, and I'll just skip over the rest of that. Um, the sugar is there to give sweetness, and that's, that's an obvious uh, important functional role that, we, that nobody would disagree with. But if it wasn't for the presence of sugar in ice cream, it would be hard frozen like a solid ice cube. So the sugar gives us the softness and scoopability because of its ability to depress the freezing point, and that results in still a, a, a portion of water or a portion of sugar solution, if you like, that remains unfrozen in ice cream at freezer cabinet temperatures. And that's why, of course, it's, it's scoopable and lickable and chewable at minus 12 or minus 14 degrees. So trying to replace that sugar means that we have to not only get the sweetness right, but we have to match that freezing curve to give us the right softness and scoopability. So this is just an example of a freezing curve where we show the amount of water frozen, and that gives us the texture or the scoopability and the temperature at which that occurs. So if you're going to make ice cream and it's going to go into a scoop shop, it all has to have the same level of scoopability, which means controlling that sugar concentration very, very tightly. Now, in the case of the ice cream product that I just showed you, they used maltitol because it's a, alcohol, a sugar alcohol that's, that's um, um, derived from maltose, the disaccharide. So that disaccharide gives you the same freezing point depression as the sucrose and gives you the same softness and scoopability. Maltitol is not quite as sweet as sucrose, so the additional sucralose just increases the intensity of the maltitol sweetness to try to match the sucrose sweetness. So that combination in this particular application gives rise to the desired endpoint. So my conclusions here, uh, sugars contribute many functional properties to foods beyond sweetness, and these high potency sweeteners in many, many cases are just, just not options because they don't have the, the right properties and they don't contribute bulk uh, to the food materials. So sugar reduction or replacement, it's application specific. Uh, in many cases, the functional properties are difficult to overcome, and there's no one sort of easy answer. We just can't throw stevia at every product that, that we make. Uh, and in the end, what have we really accomplished? Why did we do that? If we're doing it to produce a low glycemic index product, that's fine, but that's often not coupled with caloric reduction. If we're doing it for caloric reduction, 
uh, then that's another case where now we have to make sure we replace the bulk with bulking agents, and that gets us into another whole kettle of fish. Um, hi, Dr. Goff. At the meantime, uh, we have a few questions for you. Um, the first one is whether there is a correlation between water activity and moisture content in food. Uh, the simple answer is that no, there isn't. The water activity um, is controlled by, primarily by the presence of solutes uh, and also perhaps some large uh, molecular weight polymers as well. So there is not an, a, a correlation between the two, uh, and that's why the, the measure of water activity was developed really as a way of going beyond water content in terms of being able to predict uh, shelf stability. Okay, okay, that's great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Goff, for the great discussion examples for each functional roles of sugar. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Julian Cooper. He's professor at University of Reading and a internationally renowned sugar and carbohydrate expert. Dr. Cooper has worked over 35 years with many major food companies, research associations, and universities in Europe, North America, and Japan in the area of product development, carbohydrate chemistry, product reformulation, scientific research, and food regulation. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and a fellow of the Institute of Food Science and Technology in the UK. His talk today will focus on challenges in replacing or reducing sugar in food. Now please join me in welcoming Dr. Cooper. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to Flora for the very kind introduction, and thank you to the Canadian Sugar Institute for the invitation to talk to you this afternoon. Uh, thanks must also go to Doug for his excellent presentation, which leads very nicely into my presentation, which looks at the challenging uh, the challenges in replacing uh, or reducing sugar in food products. So my presentation today will look at uh, what does sugar deliver in products, uh, and, and as I say, Doug has given us a very good intro into that. Look at why uh, why reformulate, why customers and consumers want us to reformulate, why uh, manufacturers may want to reformulate to, uh, to illustrate in, uh, innovation. Look at how the multifunctionality of sugar can be replaced and also look at some of the considerations we need to consider uh, when we are reformulating anything from food safety to calorie reduction. Before we kick off with the, the main part of my presentation, we, we would like to uh, ask for your input. Um, so can you have a look at the question that is now on the screen? Uh, in Canada, in order for a food product to make the claim reduced in sugar on its package, it must be modified to contain 25% uh, uh, less sugars and be at least 10% lower in calories compared to a similar reference food. We would ask you to agree or disagree with this statement. Uh, and if you don't know, that is also a valid, uh, valid response. Uh, I will give you a, a few seconds to, to register your, your answers and we will have a look at the results later in the presentation. So if we move on now to what does sugar deliver, uh, and specifically what does sugar deliver in products? It is recognized. If you ask the, the, the man or woman in the street, they will recognize sugar as something they have in their kitchen cupboard at, at home. Uh, it is natural. It is a traditional ingredient that has been around for many, many centuries. We heard very eloquently from Doug that it has many functions in different products, and this multifunctionality can at times be difficult to replicate with other ingredients. It's a clean label. You only have to put sugar on the ingredient declaration. It has four calories per gram. Many people think it has a lot more calories than this. If you compare with fat, fat has nine calories per gram. And it does, at times, when I talk to people, I say that sugar has a medium glycemic index only of 65. Many people think it's a lot higher. Uh, but in fact, because it is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose, it gives us that medium glycemic index. So, why would people want to reformulate? Well, you may have heard that they want to replace or reduce certain ingredients. The ones that are, are front and center at the moment are, are fat, and in particular saturated fat. 
salt, and of course, sugar, which is what we're talking about today. Many manufacturers may want to reformulate to include functional uh, ingredients in their products to deliver a greater impact of their product, to deliver a functional uh, effect to consumers, whether that be uh, high in polyunsaturates or low in salt or whatever. It provides that functional product. It also provides a choice for consumers, and, and consumers need to be able to have a choice of products, whether they are high calorie, low calorie, high sugar, low sugar, that so provides this choice for consumers. Um, it also illustrates for uh, manufacturers that they are developing new products, it's showing innovation, it's giving something new for their shareholders and showing that they are delivering shareholder value. One of the main things that we want to consider maybe with, with, with sugar is reducing the energy density in products. So you may want to look at fiber, you may want to look at other ingredients that provide the bulk but don't provide the calories. So this reduction in calories to me is, is fundamental when it comes down to sugar products. Uh, and we'll see uh, the results from, uh, from what you guys think uh, in terms of the questions we asked earlier in the presentation. Uh, as we heard from Doug, uh, sugar is seen as the gold standard for sweetness, uh, but you can replace its sweetness with the high intensity or high potency sweeteners and polyols. They have, uh, certainly the high intensity sweeteners have a higher sweetness than sugar and the polyols have a very similar sweetness to sugar, so you can replace that sweetness. You can replace the mouthfeel and the texture with hydrocolloids and polyols and sugars, so you actually can get the same mouthfeel and texture. You can replace the structure with bulking agents and fibers and polyols. And then when you look at the, the colors and flavors that were generated by caramelization and the Maillard reaction, you then have to start looking at uh, replacement colors and flavors. Some of them are synthetic. Some of them are classed as additives. And the same is also true for stability, for preservation, where you have to use preservatives like sodium benzoate uh, and similar ones. In terms of the considerations you have to look at, you, you have multiple ingredients. You have increased warnings and labelings, for example, polyols uh, with uh, problems with laxation. You have aspartame, where you have to say is a source of phenylalanine. You may have gastrointestinal consequences, which is, which is a nice way of saying, again, may cause laxation. We heard from Doug very eloquently about the water activity, so the food safety may be compromised. And you may find that by reducing sugar, you may actually increase calories, and I'll give examples of that. And the ultimate uh, final test is, of course, the, the consumer acceptance and the taste acceptance, which is very important for the, for the manufacturer. If we look now at, at trying to illustrate what I've been saying, if you look at, say, a regular jam uh, against a sugar-free preserve, and again, you can't call this a jam because uh, certainly I know in Canada as well as, as, as the European Union, jams have a regulation and you can only call a certain material a jam. So you have to call it something else. If you look at the regular jam, it contains strawberries, which is a good thing, uh, sugar, glucose, glucose fructose syrups, pectin, citric acid, etc. And I'll explain on the next slide what those deliver into, into the jam. For this sugar-free preserve, you've got water as a main component. You have strawberries, you have polydextrose, you have maltodextrin, locus bingum, natural flavor, citric acid, potassium sorbate, sucralose, calcium chloride, and a red, red 40, which is a color. So if we now look at what all these things deliver in those, in those two products, so in your regular jam, your strawberries, your sugar, your glucose deliver sweetness. They also, along with the pectin, deliver bulk. The pectin, in combination with, with the sugar and glucose, give you the gelling. The sugars give you the water activity and thus the preservative effect. You get the acidity balance, and the citric acid also controls the pectin gelation. And the sugars, as they are cooked in the jam, give you the color and the flavor. So in your sugar-free preserve, your, your sweetness is provided a bit by the strawberries, but primarily from the sucralose, the high-potency sweetener. The strawberries provide the bulk along with the water, the polydextrose, the fruit pectin, the locus bean gum, all providing the, the gel that holds the, the strawberries together. You get the gelling from the fruit pectin, but because you haven't got the high sugars there, you have to add calcium chloride to aid the pectin to gel. 
you have to add in a preservative because a very high level of water, you don't get the high water acti- or the, 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 the water activity reduction that you get with, with, um, with sugar. Therefore, you have to add in potassium sorbate as a preservative. You get the acidity from the citric acid. You have to have a natural flavor. You have to have the color, which are produced by the cooking uh, actions when you actually make the jam. If we look now at, at a model system, so this is an example of an energy uh, increase where you, are, where you think you're getting a, a, a reduction in sugar. The regular cake on the side, I, I have taken out the protein, so there's, there's, there's no protein in there, just looked at the fat, the sugar, and, and the starch from the flour. Each 100 grams of, e, of, of each component, they could deliver 900 calories, 400 calories, 400 calories, respectively. If you now look at the right side of, of that, uh, that table, you will see uh, we've, we've halved the sugar. So we've taken half the sugar out, but we've replaced half that sweetness with a high-potency sweetener. But because the high-potency sweetener is 200 times more sweet than the sugar, you need to use a lot less of it. So you're typically only adding 50 grams of the sugar-sweetener mix. So you end up there where you have a reduction in calories, but you also have a smaller cake. So when you do the, 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 uh, the, the maths on it, you find that the regular cake has got a cal- caloric value of 567 calories per 100 grams, whereas your calorie-reduced cake has actually gone up and gives you 600 calories because, of course, your fat becomes a higher percentage of your product and you get this anomalous situation where, by using a low-calorie ingredient, you actually increase the calories in your cake. And I have had uh, customers ring me up and said, why, when I use this combination of sugar and sweeteners, do my calories go up when, in fact, they should go down? It is because you don't get the bulk from the high-potency sweeteners. You get a very similar effect when people say, well, I can just take out the sugar bit by bit so I can do a stepwise reduction. Uh, So we start off with this shortbread recipe, which contains 110 grams of butter, 175 grams of flour, caster sugar at 50 grams. And as you see, if you were just to assume that you were taking calories out every time you took the sugar out, you could get a reduction of 30 calories and reduce your sugars to 10.9%, the lower, lower figures at the bottom of the table. However, if you use a spreadsheet that most NPD people are used to, where you look at the balance and it actually gives you a percentage composition, under normal terms, this this spreadsheet will be active, but we haven't been able to get it active on on this presentation. But what you do is you take the sugar point, which is the 50 grams, and just gradually reduce that in this spreadsheet, and you can see what impact it has on the calories. And the next slide shows us the results you get when you start taking out the sugar. You find that you start off at 463 calories per 100 grams with 50 grams of sugar. And as you gradually take the sugar out, you would expect your calories to reduce. In fact, they remain very, very similar. In fact, you could say they're starting to increase. So by the time you get to 35 grams of sugar, 10.9% on your 100 grams, your calories have gone up from 463 to 466. Again, it's this combination of sugar and fat that is very, very difficult to uh, solve when you start to reduce the sugar, your fat becomes a higher percentage of your, cal- of, of your product, and your calories stay the same in a good case, and at times will actually start to increase. And this is illustrated quite nicely when you look at, say, breakfast cereals. This is, these are real products. I won't, won't name the product, but I'm sure you can guess what it is. This is a UK product. You have a regular sugar-coated product, which has 37 grams per 100 grams of sugar. It's got an energy of 371 uh, calories per 100 grams. And bear in mind that uh, a bowl of cereal is typically about 30 grams, so a third of that. If you go to the reduced sugar product, and you'll see the flashes at the top of the presentation, one-third less sugar, Nothing added, just sugar taken away. You'd expect to get a reduction in calories when, in fact, your reduced sugar product is 369 calories, so a magnificent reduction of 2 calories per 100 grams. In a bowl, you'd be hard pushed to measure it. Your regular product, i.e. the uncoated product, is 373. That's because the basis of most cereal products is starch, which has exactly the same caloric value 
as the sugars that you're taking out. So again, you have to be very mindful of the fact. And if you look very carefully at that table as well, and you'll be able to look at these, these tables, I, I think the presentation will be, will be on the uh, Canadian Sugar Institute website, you can see that, in fact, your salt goes up and your fat goes up as you reduce the sugar. So it's this sugar, salt, fat uh, triangle that is very difficult to crack. When I worked for a sugar company, we carried out some, some work at Leatherhead Food Research. You may be aware of, of that uh, group in, in the UK. We got some consumer focus groups and we used a web questionnaire and we found that many people were very aware of product claims. So, for example, no added sugars and reduced sugars and reduced energy, reduced fat, etc. But there was very little awareness of the level of reduction or the associated calorie reduction. And they expected, when they saw uh, a reduction in sugar content, they expected to have a reduction in the calorie content. And therefore, they were quite confused and at times a bit disappointed that they saw a sugar-reduced product that didn't deliver this calorie reduction. If you remember at the start of my presentation, we had a, a, a poll where we asked you guys, uh, what was your view? Let's see what the results say now. So basically, in Canada... In order for a fruit product to make the claim reduced in sugar on its package, it must be modified to contain at least 25% less sugars and be at least 10% lower in calories compared to a similar reference foods. And nearly 63% of you agreed with that statement. Only 23.7, so just under a quarter of you, disagreed. In fact, the ones that disagreed are correct. You do not have to have a calorie reduction compared to your reference food. All you have to do in Canada is lower the sugars by 25% to make that claim. I'm sure that Flora, at the end of the presentation, will be able to give you chapter and verse on that. But again, it's very useful for you guys to see that you don't need to have a calorie reduction. And the Canadian Sugar Institute did carry out some research uh, with dietitians. Uh, this was in, uh, uh, published in, in, in a recent journal, and a survey amongst Canadian dietitians, uh, 140, revealed that they expected to see a similar calorie reduction if a product was carrying a reduced in sugar claim. So they expected, well, nearly 50% of that, 47%, just under 50%, uh, expected to have a 25% reduction in calories. So, again, there is this anomaly where you can reduce sugar but not get that reduction in calories. And also, quite interestingly, if you had the breakfast cereal products, you may also get an increase in the glycemic index. Because if you remember early in my presentation, I said that sugar had a, a glycemic index of 65. Therefore, if you actually reduce the sugar, you get a greater increase in the starch, which has got a glycemic index of 100, so you can actually get an increase in your glycemic uh, index by a reduction in sugars. So, many apologies for the sound quality. I hope that the, the last part of the presentation has, has been uh, better heard and better understood. Uh, in summary, sugar its a natural, traditional, multifunctional ingredient. Bear in mind that sugars on nutritional labels are not just sugar. They are all the mono and disaccharides, so all the ones that Doug talked about, the glucose, the fructose, the maltose, the lactose even, that's what sugars are on the nutritional labels. There is no single unique sugar replacer for all applications. You have to look at what sugar does in the various products to actually get that delivery of that functionality. Reformulation must deliver improved nutritional um, an, a new, um, an improved nutritional profile and preferably a reduction in calories as you see that's not always the case and sometimes if you just gradually reduce the amount of sugar in a product it may not deliver everything that you want it may not deliver that reduction in calories it may even give you a higher increase in calories anyway many thanks for your attention if you need to contact me that's my email there and i'm happy to, to contact be contacted via the canadian sugar institute as well and i'll now hand back to flora for uh, any questions that she may want to ask either doug or myself 
Yes, um, thank you very much, Julian. And um, just a quick note regarding the voice issues. Um, so the archived version will have all the voice cleaned up, so it will be um, much um, clearer when you hear the archived version after the webinar. And so I, um, I have um, a few questions, and I also encourage people on the line to submit your questions, um, and we'll address as many as possible. So the very first question um, is, for um, maybe Julian, if you can elaborate first. So how would reformulation meet consumers' request for clean label? That is a very, very pertinent question. Uh, as, as I have explained, uh, typically when you replace sugar, sugar is there as the single thing on the label. If you go back to the, the example of the jam and the, the sugar-free preserve, you see that you don't get a clean label. You get a lot of materials that maybe the consumer doesn't understand. Uh, you get a lot of, certainly in the EU, you get a lot of e-numbers. So for us, that's an additive, uh, which a lot of consumers don't want. So it is very, very difficult to actually deliver that reformulation with a clean label, with a small number of ingredients. So I, I, that, that one is a real killer question. So good question there. I do not have the exact answer on that. Uh, I'm not sure if Doug would like to comment, but that one is, is the one that would, if, if either Doug or myself could get it, we would be very wealthy men. <laughs> um, my, my only comment would be that if, if your sugar is there simply to provide sweetness, and your sugar-sweetened uh, soft drinks would be a good example, then it's easy to replace that with a uh, non-nutritive, high-potency sweetener uh, because you don't have any other functionalities that, that you need to replace. You do change the texture a little bit. And, and in that case, the, the label might also be just as simple. But, but those examples are, are, you know, not the norm. That's a very good point, Doug. Um, but typically you'll find that most soft drink manufacturers will use a combination or a blend of sweetness to get the, the sweetness as close to sucrose. So, Maybe with uh, a, a soft drink, you'll just have sucrose or maybe uh, high fructose corn syrup, uh, and you then have to replace that with a combination of maybe uh, uh, aspartame with acyl MK. Uh, typically in the UK, we, we, they, they, they throw the kitchen sink at it. You actually have saccharin, uh, acyl MK, and aspartame, and any combination thereof. Um, thank you, um, and I agree. So, when, for consumers who are uh, people who are looking at a particular product with reducing sugar, they maybe um, it's more um, they better look at the ingredient there to to see what are the other ingredients added, trying to replace the functional role. Seeing some foods that sugar do play multiple roles. Um, I have a question for um, Dr. Goff. So, what is the role for guar gum? in the regular or like full sugar ice cream? Oh, uh, guar gum is a stabilizer. So it's a, it's a polysaccharide that's extracted from the guar bean, um, and uh, it's used to increase the viscosity of the water phase, and that gives you some mouthfeel properties, but also, very importantly, it controls the rate of ice recrystallization or ice growth to give you a smoother texture and a longer shelf life. So uh, guar and um, locust bean gum would be examples there of uh, stabilizing agents. Okay, thank you. Um, I wonder, I want to ask two speakers, um, can you think of any type of food that is really impossible or really difficult to re replace the sugar content completely? Uh, table things. sugar. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's uh, gosh, it's awful hard. It, 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 it's I, I would I would say that it's nothing is impossible. Uh, we do have a, a lot of food ingredients and new food ingredients on the horizon, um, so nothing is ever impossible. Uh, we, we we've indicated the difficulties, but uh, you know I, I think any good product developer could come up with alternatives to almost any ingredient in a food product. Wouldn't disagree on that. Um, 
there's there's no such thing as impossible. You just have to use a combination, and that and it's the combination you have to use that that can be challenging both for the product developer but also the consumer. I suppose the the, the one that that uh, I think about is say something like fudge, where you have the crystallization of of the sugar, um, and and you control that crystallization and you get the caramelization. That is actually quite difficult to replicate because sugar is highly soluble, and even if you use the polyols, which are semi-crystalline, um, you don't have the same solubility. So it's that ability of sugar to dissolve quite quickly. So some of those where you're reliant on that crystallization of sugar um, and the solubility are, are quite difficult to, to replicate. Um, thank you. Um, another question from the audience is about adding rows. Um, would um, any of you can comment on that? On allulose? Yes. Um, well, it. Uh, I don't have any personal experience with with that. It is a a perhaps a, a sugar alternative that may be on the horizon. Um, it is a. Um, uh, I think it's a monosaccharide. It's one of the uh, monosaccharides that's found in very small quantity in nature, but it's one that can be synthesized. And as a result of that ability to uh, synthesize it, um, it could be available. So I think it would be um, not uh, metabolized in the same way that, that glucose and fructose would be. And so I, I, I think it's likely more similar to a polyol in that sense. Uh, I'm not very familiar with the sweetness profile of it. Um, maybe Julian has a little bit more insight into that, but it's one of those ones that may appear on the market someday. Um, as a carbohydrate chemist, when, when I was doing my carbohydrate chemistry PhD, uh, I came across this sugar. Um, if you look in the textbooks, uh, it's referred to as psychos. Um, I'm not sure why they didn't use that term instead of allulose, but I can guess why. Um, it's essentially a keto sugar, so it's very similar to fructose. In fact, it's more like one of the other keto hexoses, which is a, a sugar called tagatose. Uh, all of the keto hexoses are remarkably active in the Maillard reaction, so they brown very, very quickly. But both tagatose and allulose, or psychose, did take, take, take your choice on, on the name of it, um, they are not digested fully like fructose, uh, and they do have uh, these gastrointestinal consequences, uh, very similar to the polyols that, that Doug talked about. So um, even though it would be classed and it would be uh, on the label, it would be declared as sugars because it's a monosaccharide. Uh, however, it would have the uh, laxative effect of a polyol. So uh, if it was in, in Europe, I should imagine it would have a limitation on the amount you could use, and you may even have to put a, a laxation warning on the label. Um, let's say very, very similar to tagatose. Tagatose has been around and has been approved as a novel food in Europe for probably 15, 20 years, but hasn't had a major market uh, associated with it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, because there is a limit of time, we cannot address all your questions today, but we will try to provide answers in other formats. Um, finally, I would like to thank our speakers for your valuable input today, and I would like to remind um, all our attendants that the content today will be archived, and the link is the same as the one you used to access the webinar today.